We're victims of our own short-term thinking, and what we have to do is start to look further out to those horizons, 20, 30, 50, 100 plus years, and think about positive futures and what could happen and how we could be better. One of the things I'm most excited about is reducing the cost of living, cost of housing, to free people up to, to do more interesting work, uh, whatever work they're called to, whether that's staying at home with kids, whether that's starting a company, whether that's uh, taking care of other people, whatever, whatever that looks like. I think that in 2050, it's gonna be much easier for people to connect, interact, and communicate uh, with people uh, all over the world in real time. I hope in the future, uh, people will use technology to embrace and amplify our culture, our identity, rather than eliminating them or subtracting them. Quality, equitable housing, lower cost of living so that we spend more time doing what we want to do, social change that leads to increased quality of life. Those are kind of the drivers of like why I get up and do this work. The hierarchy of needs, you know, housing, housing's right there. The mission of Dern Robotics is to radically reduce the cost of housing. Uh, and we want to do this uh, to, to reduce the cost of low-income housing, but also to make new kinds of living possible. Whether it's cities with no cars, whether it's uh, new neighborhoods, uh, the kind of the sky's the limit and kind of open up the possibilities uh, for, for what, what housing looks like and, and uh, what neighborhoods look like. 3D printing is changing the construction industry in a lot of ways. Cost and complexity on site. Anytime you're going to a single material or single process to put together most of the wall assembly, you've already got a simpler structure to start with. The main difference between Terran and other uh, 3D printed construction companies uh, are, are that we're using a sustainable material. And most other companies are using some form of, of concrete, which has a huge carbon footprint. Uh, they're also extruding. With our robot, we can pick and place all kinds of things, whether it's the material we're starting with for the walls, the adobe, ends up being a, a, a much different process uh, and also much more amenable to automation of future construction processes. The sky's the limit on where we can go next. 3D printing is one of those technologies that when it first came out, I think we were like, that's so cool. The applications are endless. And guess what? They are. My feeling is in the future, instead of same day delivery on Amazon, it'll just be same day print. You buy it and you print it. And now I have that wrench that I wanted. Or now I have the headphone stand that I needed. It's just printed at your home. Or when there's food printers. What do you want tonight, honey? Ah, oh, burrito? Print it. Doesn't matter if we don't have the ingredients in the fridge. We have the machine to make it for us. Repairability with 3D printers, it's already here, but it's just going to get bigger and bigger as more people become comfortable with the technology. An example of this would be the 3D printer that I own, a part broke on it. So I used my 3D printer to print the new part for it. When we talk about smart homes these days, this is still very, very early rudimentary capabilities. But looking ahead, we're going to talk about technologies that are much more pervasive throughout all of our environment, but certainly in our homes things like smart fridges that can reorder food as it detects that your supplies are getting low. The opportunities to be able to make life much more convenient, much more comfortable, uh, is pretty significant by having that much computing power in your home. I think cooking has always been this social thing and, and eating together that, that brings people together. And I think that will still have a place in the future, even though we will would like to have more convenience and so on. What we do is we bring in sensors in the pots and pans, and that measures the temperature directly where you're cooking your food. And then the pots and pans talk to your stovetop and adjust the heat so you maintain the exact right temperature for your cooking. In the future, I would say when I get up in the morning, the soft boiled egg has already been cooked to the way I want it to be done. The same thing when I come home, this will be part of, of uh, when I'm deciding what I would like to eat. The refrigerator will know the, the time to prepare a proper meal, even though we might need to get some groceries uh, delivered to the house. When you think about a lot of these innovation adoption models, what you see is there's, there's people that like to play the and be the early adopters of technology. And then at some point it sort of transition over the chasm, if you will, and becomes more mainstream technology. Then if you go 20 years back, 
the way we imagine technologies to be today, we could imagine flying cars and whatnot. We realized that that's, that's hard, but no one could imagine smartphones. No one could have imagined this kind of software we're using today. So, so often advancement doesn't happen always as we imagine it to. Um, and I really think the way we will see robots, which we are sort of beginning to see the cusp of today, is into more and more pretty specific solutions. But today we are, we are seeing a huge growth in robot startups that does like fully automated canteens, right? A small container, you drive it into your company and there's a, there's a few of our robots cooking your lunch, right? And you can order it and then your lunch will be ready in 30 seconds and it's beautiful food. So we see them coming in in very many purposefully designed uh, areas. So having people being enslaved in front of machines, having that as their life, we want to liberate the creative part of people's minds to do what even accelerates uh, our value equation even more. And, and hopefully that could also be some of the bigger vehicles to creating even more equality across the world. Hopefully ending uh, poverty. Uh, we still have a lot of corners of the world to bring up to, uh, to the standards that we know as life today. When you think about textiles, textiles are actually a great substrate for integration of technology because they're ubiquitous, right? Like the clothing that we wear is that scarf uh, in the winter and it's this carpet around us, the upholstery, the curtains. My work tries to integrate microelectronic devices and functional fibers seamlessly into the fabrics for various applications, health sensing, space exploration, and also like interactive environments, inter interactive arts and human computer interaction. Basically, the vision is to embed technologies invisibly within materials. Uh, so there are a lot of applications if we think about uh, electronic textiles or technological textiles. I've developed one called Scarf Keyboard because it's Scarf that has integrated touch, pressure, and stretch sensors to enable new ways of keyboard play or piano play. And it gives you an organic, intimate expression of in, in music making. Textile or soft materials you know, are squishy. They're, they're tactile and then has a nice texture. So it's an amazing interfaces for physical expressions. So the keyboard allows musicians to perform these various multimodal interactions while exploring this nice materiality of the scarf. Another one is called the, the Magic Carpet or Tapi Magic. And it's a, it, this project is inspired by my conversation with a dancer. You know, as a dancer, you don't have, you don't usually have agency over the music. And this carpet basically allows you to convert movement in, into sound, or choreography into music. Uh, so it enables the future performance where now dancers have agency of controlling the sound that they choreograph with. My work has been all about integrating technology seamlessly and working in the background. So by embedding this technology into materials that are common, that are like humble textile materials, it allows us to be more present so that we can really be in focus with each other. So I could see the home of 2050 continuing down this minimalistic trend of just being very sleek and clean and sustainable in its appliances. I could even see tinier homes being more of the trend as they're starting to. But in terms of technology, I think don't underestimate the power of screens. Screen-based technologies, I think, will still have screens. I think they'll, they'll become more integral to the environment, to the world that we're living in. So I think that, you know, uh, particularly screens that are, that are highly efficient and super high resolution, so they actually become part of the furnishing of the home. So when they're not, when you're not watching a show from your favorite streaming service, it's actually showing you art or it's showing you um, like a live view from a, from a forest. And essentially that's its off state. So it's not just this black hole. But I could see screens being all over your home and a lot of them, you know, allow you to communicate with people around the world. So if you have family who live elsewhere, you just tap on these screens and it's almost like is if they're in the home with you because the high definition by then will be so much more advanced. Hey there, I'm Andrew Freer. I'm the product manager for Proto, uh, coming to you in hologram form. I would say, you know, Zoom is amazing, but does it have the feeling of really being there with someone? Not, not quite, right? We're using the hardware that we have today 
but this could be leveraged in the future for whatever new technologies come out, right? Holoportation is the ability to beam yourself from wherever you are to wherever you need to be in real time uh, with the ability to hear, see, and completely interact with each person in each location that you're being beamed into. It makes you look like you're really there. We're sort of where like Zoom leaves off and we're physically being there starts. So there's a lot of space in between. And what we've noticed is that there's a chemical reaction that only exists when two or more people share the same space at the same time. Proto comes as close to that as possible because you feel like you're there. The shadows, the reflections, the volume that only a real person can bring is really what happens with a Proto connection. The idea of Proto is not just a communication platform, but it's a connection device. It's a travel replacement solution. This is being used for telemedicine right now. We've got Proto Epics at St. Jude's where patients are beaming in so they can be treated and diagnosed and the, the doctor can really see stuff that is happening with the patient that they could never see through other traditional telehealth means. Really recreating the person uh, through an avatar uh, and also showing where the, the pain points might be uh, in the case of a fracture or some other medical issue.